The Pilgrim Fathers, Drake, Raleigh, Brunel, Reynolds, just a few of the names that have made this great naval port part of England's history and heritage. And yet, for the second time in just four years, Plymouth has lent its name to one of the zaniest sporting events of the year. It was last in 1987 that the Cornwall and Devon Land Rover Club hosted the now infamous National Championships. But you haven't actually seen the vehicle hit it. The event is a magnet for Land Rover clubs, not just from the UK, but from all over the continent. People say that uh, you have to be crazy to take part in uh, Land Rover competitions. That's probably right. Uh, but the great joy of it is, I think, that the Land Rover, even though today uh, the Discovery and the Range Rover are very sophisticated vehicles. Most people can take part in a vehicle which they can pick up very cheaply, a matter of hundred pounds. It doesn't cost them a great deal to make that vehicle safe uh, and they can take part and it costs them very little to actually compete in these events which is unlike most motorsports which are becoming very very expensive and so we like to think that we can provide them with good sport very cheaply and perhaps more particularly it's a sport which all the family can take part in. But what sort of person drags the family hundreds of miles to camp out in rural backwoods for days on end and suffer the absolute limit of discomfort? This year we have somewhere in excess of 450 entrants. Those come from all over the UK uh, because there are ARC clubs dotted right throughout from Scotland in the north to Wales and down to the southwest, southeast. In addition, uh, this year there are, there are, I think, about eight competitors coming from the continent. Uh, I've seen them here from Norway, Denmark, as well as several from Germany. I think there's one from France. And I also think that we have two competitors from uh, the United States. But as any true enthusiast will tell you, it's the vehicles that reign supreme here. Before they'll even let you onto the course, a team of expert scrutineers give your machine the sort of going over that the Ministry of Transport has been trying to achieve for years. In fact, it's true to say that if your average road car was put through this scrutineering, it'd probably fail. That section of the regulation applies to all events and all vehicles. Anything else? No, that's it. So while this competitor goes off to fix the steering, the lucky ones, having survived the scrutineers, now make their way to the course there to be given their marching orders by the organiser, Dave Marsh. If you just listen to what I'm telling you now and we'll be okay. First things first, you will stay with your groups. If you break down, if you can repair it on the section before they finish, you can finish at that section at the end of the group. If you fail to do so and return to the campsite to repair, you rejoin your group and you will collect a 12 for every section you have missed. Is that clear? Right, fair enough. What we <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you got all that. Really, though, it's quite simple. If you haven't already guessed, the RTV, or Road Taxed Vehicle Trial, is for vehicles that are, well, road taxed. Yes, that really means that they drive these things on the open road. The vehicles, spanning a period of 40-plus years, and including such rare sights as the 101 Army Forward Control Vehicle, as well as many old and not so old Land Rovers and Range Rovers, slowly and sedately make their way down to the woods, with hope in their hearts and the kids in the back. And who knows what challenges await them there. This year attracts a record entry for the RTV, the main essence of which is that it should be non-damaging. As number 153 from Staffordshire and Shropshire gets underway, in a particularly boggy section of the course, Ian Beckett, a policeman from Holsworthy, who's obviously bored with normal traffic duties, describes the course. We started setting up the course in February to make sure we had enough time to for any hiccups. We used five vehicles in all. My own 88, Rex Ward's 90, a Range Rover and a Series 1 and another 88. We used the five different vehicles so that we could find a balance on the sections so that it would be possible for a Range Rover to compete as well as being competitive with an 80. A vehicle must travel from point A to point B 
through a series of gates marked by canes. The gates are numbered 12 down to 1. The vehicle must go through the gates, take the most direct route, not touch the canes. If the vehicle touches a cane, say he touches the 10 cane, he scores 10. If he goes all the way through without touching any of the canes, then he achieves the best score, which is zero. The vehicle mustn't stop on the section, except for long wheelbase vehicles, which are Range Rovers, Discoveries and long wheelbase Land Rovers, vehicles with a wheelbase of more than 100 inches. They're allowed to stop and take one shunt, which means they, they reverse, set themselves up again, and then start again. The great appeal of this particular event is that it gives everyone a chance to take part on an equal footing. Whether they're driving a brand new Range Rover or a venerable Series 1. The Series 1 vehicles competing, most were built during the late 1940s, early 1950s, well up to 1958. Um, they're competing alongside the modern day Land Rovers that were built probably only two or three years ago. Richard Sedgwick from Nero here. He's driving a Class 7 vehicle. He went on to finish second in his class and fourth overall. I think RTV trials is probably the easiest way for someone to start trialing Land Rovers. You can use one vehicle for your recreation purposes as well as carrying the kids around and doing whatever you do with your ordinary everyday vehicle. It's The courses are designed hopefully so that there is no damage caused to the vehicle. Obviously we all make mistakes and occasionally you might get the odd dent but uh, in the main the courses are designed to be non-damaging. This is Andrew Foster, unfortunately not from Gloucester but from Staffs and Shrops. He's taking Ian at his word and driving very carefully indeed. His Series 2 88 is typical of the vehicles that many Land Rover owners use to combine everyday motoring and eventing. But he's just a little too slow here, not quite enough momentum to get him to the line first time, so Andrew misses out on his clear. You can pay as little as £50 for a Land Rover up to, was it £33,000 for a Range Rover and compete with either vehicle quite, uh, quite easily. Doug Tanner from the Midlands Club did well, eventually coming second in Class 4 and 13th overall. Unlucky for some, but not for Doug. Though this bank did get the better of him, ended up costing him a valuable point. There was one entrant who gave the organisers quite a few headaches. Because of the height of the forward control, we had to cut down a lot of low-hanging branches. It's the largest vehicle that Land Rover have built. It's seven feet tall, six feet wide, a wheelbase of 101 inches. It's um, quite an impressive vehicle, really. And I think it takes a brave man to drive one off the road.
While this band of intrepid souls try to avoid destroying perfectly good road vehicles, further down in the woods is a group whose sanity must be the subject of considerable doubt. Yes, you're right. He's driven a perfectly good vehicle straight into a four-foot-deep muddy puddle with a strategically placed stone wall under the surface. Oh, look, he's gone for a swim. Now, even the audience of aficionados think that this is perhaps the limit. But we should explain that there is a purpose to all this. Just up the hill is his teammate, whose job it is now to get him out. Jeff Edwards and Jean-Luc Guillaume from Southern Land Rover Club, who incidentally finished fourth out of six, this sort of masochism is perfectly acceptable. Or is it? Bloody ridiculous, really, but uh, wouldn't have missed it. The Range Rover was a bit too heavy for that uh, particular course. So uh, I think that's where the problem is, pulling a motor too heavy for what I was trying to pull out. Oh, the crowd liked it, though. Oh, they loved it. <laughs> But the rope was too short as well, that was hilarious. We, we just couldn't get the other side of the water, so we had to go into the water to start off. <laughs> Water's too deep and I'm talking to the clerk of the course here. <laughs> too wet. Too wet, yes. I'm sitting in it. <laughs> yeah. Our initial thoughts on the team recovery were to use a, a nat natural bog. Uh, we discovered that uh, access to the area we wanted to use was, was insufficient and switched our attentions to, a, to an area where we actually had to construct the, the team recovery pit from, from scratch with uh, earth moving equipment. Uh, it's been tried a number of times with varying degrees of success and we believe it will offer an extremely hard challenge to anybody that takes it up to compete in the event. Being mad is not essential, but it does help. Richard Corking found that the magic of WD-40 wasn't quite enough to cure the terminal dampness in his engine. And if that wasn't indignity enough, his mate couldn't even pull him out backwards. For those competitors wishing to complain, the bog was designed by Pete Thompson and Andy Retallick. They weren't available for comment. It won't surprise you to learn that only six teams were mad enough to attempt this event. The eventual winners were Harold Carman and Keith Boydell from Lancashire and Cheshire. And we can't leave without letting you see how it should be done. There was a man-made made hole, you see, so everybody reckoned that the actual water they filled it in was about, said, two foot deep. But when the first motor went in, you know, it, it, well, it went well over the bonnet, which the trouble was with it is if any motor actually stuck in the water, there's a chance the uh, water could actually go in the engine, but luckily enough, nobody actually stuck in the centre. And also, some of them, the water went into the back. It's like carrying a motor, trying to pull a motor out, plus 45 gallons of water, which is stuck in the back of the motor. That doesn't happen to us, you see, because we've got a lot of holes where the water drains away quickly. rules require that each vehicle in turn gets recovered. So now it's Harold's turn to get his feet wet. It was an hard event. It was uh, a lot of deep water which came lapping over the bonnet every about four foot deep, I should imagine. In an event in which power isn't tantamount, 
The strain on the transmission is the main cause of the demise of most competitors. A lot of people went out at the start of the event because uh, they broke diffs and half shafts because of the, they had probably too much power, if anything, because it was that hard of a pull. I suppose the less powered motor was an advantage, if anything. It's technique. I'll come down to technique, you see. While the towing power of the Land Rover is put to the test in the team recovery event, the winch recovery depends almost entirely on good planning and coordination. Although this may all look a bit mysterious, the explanation is comparatively simple. It's a timed event for a team of two vehicles, one winch and two or three people. By winching only, an object, in this case a large log, has to be recovered along a prescribed route and returned to its original position. Apart from attaching a tow rope, the log must never be touched by hand. Let's drop in on the proceedings as David Bowyer demonstrates his skills. Jonathan Payne, who designed the course, takes up the story. The course was one that was designed to look relatively simple, but in fact had one or two little pitfalls to ensure that perhaps even the, the skillful people were caught slightly unawares. Certainly there was a slide slope designed to make the log fall away to one side. Many people were caught with this in their first run. The techniques employed in a winch recovery require coordination between the two or three team members, ensuring that each person is in the right place at the right time. When we cut the log, it was chosen for being a fairly substantial piece of material without being excessively heavy, not in true Land Rover winching terms. It weighs probably about a ton. It was also designed because it was a fairly unwieldy shape and thus tend to move around in anything but a straight line. David actually took over 17 minutes to complete the course. Time well spent, you may say. But Peter Hicks managed to do it twice in 12 minutes and 17 seconds and went on to take the trophy. Back in the pits, there's an air of camaraderie as some competitors indulge in a little last-minute fine-tuning. <laughs> Camping nearby in a converted army ambulance, we found Uli from much further afield. I'm from Germany, from the north of Germany, and I'm here for the national rally. You're not a competitor? No, I'm only a spectator here. I'm here in the Midland Rover Owners Club. Now this is why I'm standing here, between the British peoples. Yeah, this is a, uh, an ex-army field ambulance from the British Army I mean, in Germany. It's converted to a camp mobile. Now we are Midland Rover Owners. Some people just can't bear to be too far away from their vehicles. If they can't sleep inside, like Uli, they make sure they sleep as near as possible. Back on the RTV course, things were really hotting up. A tie between Michael Joy and Stephen Wilson means a runoff against the clock. Speed is a word with a relative meaning, though. And in this case, the slowest time wins. And no doubt everyone back at the Nook is really on the edge of their seats by now. Did he hit it? Did he hit it? So it's a tough act to follow for Stephen. Mike completed the course with absolutely no penalty points. Yep. Okay. Right. Yep. Where right. you go, chap. I shall say, ready, go. When I say go, I'll hit the button. All right. Ready, go. And so with precision timing, Stephen leaps into action very slowly. Of course, he's got to be as slow as possible, but he mustn't actually stop. It's a delicate job to keep inching along. 
Is he going to stop? Is he? Is he? No. Oh, no, he's stuck. Tricky moment there. Judges watching every move of the tyres, and that's it. A full stop. And the clear winner is Mike Joy of Red Rose. Well done, Chad. You're the winner. This is my vehicle named Rufus, comprised of a 1979 Range Rover, and shortened 12 inches in the middle. The course was very nicely set out with quite a lot of hidden canes. It was uh, very comical going through the 10 gates, looking across for the next gates, and missing the next gates which were hidden in the trees. I thought that was very good. Cleared nine sections and uh, scored uh, seven points. Land Rover owners like Mike Joy will spend hours poring over replacement parts. And at any event like this, there's a wealth of choice. A whole Land Rover could be assembled from some of these bits and pieces. Although the sight of a rusty half shaft and a leaky radiator could only capture the heart of a true enthusiast. These two have had enough. They're off to the beer tent. There's one group of Land Rover owners whose devotion for their motors verges on the fanatical. Some of these owners would be worried about driving their vehicles on the M1, let alone through woods and rivers. Their vehicles are lovingly cherished and cared for, because for those who enter the Concourse d'Elegance, appearance is everything. Here you'll see pristine examples of Land Rovers of all ages and classes. Sort of what, what year is it? 1955. And uh, where did it go first then? It went to um, from Tilbury Dock um, to the Suez Crisis, but in, I believe in '56. Um, but they'd sorted themselves out, and by the time it got there on the ship, it was turned back. And then they didn't know what to do with the vehicle, so they sent it to Germany on a ski range um, for the, like, the Nafi people um, at the time um, to carry people up and down the ski range. Um, and it then came back towards the end of the 60s um, to Britain because it was getting an old vehicle to be abroad. In the May following... Yet again, Ken Wheelwright, with his two 80-inch Series 1s, went on to take first and second prizes. Two more trophies to add to his already sagging mantelpiece. Uh, it was... won many prizes in concourse events. Uh, so, that's 438. HAC 942 is uh, a 1948 and one of the first production models of the Land Rover. It is chassis number 52. Well, it's a 1982 first registered Series 3 County petrol engine. Uh, I've only owned it for what? two and a half years now. Um, two previous owners and I can't find out a lot about it at the moment. Right, this is a 1955 station wagon. Not many of them made in this colour, which is grey. The decree lease is in the post. It's cost me more than it's worth in a long time, and I've done no work while I was doing it. I use it as everyday transport, which is why under the bonnet is filthy. After all that devotion and hard work, it's now down to the judges for the final decision. Hold on, though. Could this be a late entry just arriving? Meanwhile, Chief Scrutineer Brian Edwards is checking out the entries for tomorrow's national trial. Brian is the man who gives the thumbs up, or the elbow, to every competitor. There are a basic set of regulations and then a separate set 
on top of that for each different event. We, we fail a fair percentage on relatively minor items. The vast majority managed to correct the items and then come back and successfully pass. So what safety features does Brian pay particular attention to when scrutineering for the national trial and the comp safari? One of the, the main things to check in that are safety related items such as the, the roll cage, seats, seat belt, crash helmet and security and adequacy of all, all the vehicle steering and suspension parts. <laughs> Oh, this is Gwendolyn, this is our mascot. It was taken from the flying footages in the Second World War, where all the pilots used to sort of smack it on the arse and, uh, and jump in the plane and go for the best. We do a similar thing, smack it on the bum and jump in and hope for the best. If you're in need of a car wash, perhaps the national trial is the event for you. It's more demanding than the RTB and better suited to off-road vehicles, simply because of the type of terrain that they're expected to negotiate. And that includes driving through rivers. The object is to get through all the sections without stopping and without touching the markers. The further a vehicle gets without help, the fewer the penalty points. When we initially uh, started setting out the, the courses for the National Trial some nine months ago, we uh, conducted our initial recce. Uh, I came across this, uh, the weir at the, at the, in the river and uh, instantly thought, well, this has got to be used. Uh, it provides both the challenge to the driver and uh, a, spect a spectacle for all the spectators involved in the event. The National Trial is a, a, probably the biggest competitive challenge of the weekend. It's a real test of man and machine and their ability to keep it going throughout the day and keep their concentration to achieve overall victory, really. There are 15 sections to contend with, and each competitor starts with 12 penalties, which reduce as he goes through. That is, provided he doesn't stop or hit a marker on the way. Carol Roberts from Breckland is driving her husband David's vehicle in Class 9. Carol, driving exceptionally well in this event, which, for a woman, is very demanding because of the sheer physical strength needed to pull a vehicle of this size through so many obstacles. But although Carol won First Lady Trophy yesterday in the RTV, she didn't manage to repeat her success today. That was an honour that went to Zoe Dodge from the Midlands.
This wooded section is proving to be a challenge for the team from North Wales. I mean, what a ridiculous place to leave a tree. And it hasn't escaped the eagle eye of the Lady Marshal. So while this gentleman from Wales negotiates this section, his co-driver is gritting her teeth and thinking of England. Finally, I think this pit is going to prove to be his undoing. Down among the bluebells, we see a piece of real precision driving, with this team from Staffs and Shrops out for a quiet Sunday drive, with a gentle run along the straight in perfect style. Well, almost perfect. One. Michael Hall from Somerset and Wiltshire seems to be well on top of things. In this particular case, I think it's a large lump of tree. Bird, is that all right? And so, with the aid of a trusty winch and a convenient tree, they're off on the move again. Bye. <laughs> Why am I being filmed? <laughs> Keith Harvey in number 442 appears to be travelling incognito with a piece of strategically placed camouflage. But, disguise or not, I don't think he's going to make it. Richard Corking from the Hanson Barks Club tells us what he thought of the course. Well, today it's been quite demanding, but there's sort of tricky ones that catch you out just uh, where you hit a rock and you slide into a gate. And the hardest bit is to remember exactly where you're going. Yesterday's winner, Mike Joy, going well, full of confidence. Is he going to do as well today? Well, perhaps not. This competitor managed to get the wrong side of a fallen tree. Perhaps this is where the winch recovery team should have been. 
but no true Land Rover owner could fail to rise to such a challenge. With a little help from the marshals and a great deal of brute force, the offending woodwork was duly removed. By this time, everybody is using the trees for a variety of purposes. Some more pleasant than others. After all, what better way to straighten a bent bumper? As if the natural conditions weren't bad enough, just to make life a bit more difficult, a thousand gallons of water were deliberately poured into this hole the previous evening. Meaning for many, a sticky end. Free of their troublesome log, Mr. and Mrs. Hall continue on their way. They say don't drink and drive, unless that is you've got a very steady hand and nerves to match. And the course is clear. Glenn Thompson, alias the Flying Vicar, perhaps didn't pray quite hard enough on this section. But, undaunted, somehow he forces his way through. And he still managed to come out smiling, much to everybody's amusement.
This is Michael Gillett from the Midlands. He came in second in Class 7 and 34th overall. Michael's good performance in this section was marred by something of a setback. He picked up a few penalty points for this unscheduled stopover. But luckily there was no damage to Michael or his co-driver. Have you? Yeah, all off. Yeah. switches off. Yeah. At least you got a walk. Handbrake on. I knew you should be going over there. Driver, stay in there, mate, will you? Or someone get in it and put your foot on the foot brake. Get the pictures. Go on, then. Watch yourself there, cameraman. So, happily, unscathed, but perhaps just a little embarrassed, he's on his way. Here's another lady driver, Barbara Danson from Lancashire and Cheshire. It was very hard, um, the boulders and um, basically just the terrain itself, it's quite rough, but um, the sections were set out really well. It was a very, very good trial, very hard, it really made you think about it. Um, I think it's probably the hardest trial I've done in a couple of years now. Like. The Newnham Park course provided a comprehensive range of obstacles, from unforgiving granite to particularly inconveniently placed trees, not to mention the odd, fairly raging torrent. Some drivers managed to find them all with unerring precision. After all the bumping and scraping was over, the winner was Keith Boydell. Two down and perhaps three in a row tomorrow. For a continental view of it all, we spoke to Michael Valentina Branth from Denmark. This weekend uh, we're here for the RTB trial, uh, on which we didn't do that well, but uh, we've been here and uh, we didn't win and we didn't lose and, you know, we sorted out as number 17 and out of uh, the 97 uh, competitors and that's that's okay for us I mean we've just been here that's the main thing Michael Brandt happy just to be here in Plymouth but for the organizers things are getting a little fraught times have to be collected and collated it's a job that needs total concentration and an even temperament D. Dion has the unenviable task of timekeeping for tomorrow's comp safari. Because we have 110 vehicles, if every competitor kept going for the four laps, we have got 440 times to work out. And we calculate that as taking between 10 and 11 hours. So there has to be timekeepers at the start and finish line and in the pits to work out times solidly for 11 hours. So with that daunting prospect in mind for the timekeepers, 8 o'clock the following morning sees the marshals gathering for their briefing. We've taken in the garage there, get your vehicle in there and get back. Well, I'll drop you off anyway. Sure, I'll drop you off. Yeah, but I'll drop you off. Oh, we follow you then. Chris Dorr, the man behind the planning of the comp safari, talks us through the course. The course is, it starts off quite rough in the, the wooded area behind us here, and so it cuts out into the forest where we have some very fast straights. The longest straight is approximately two-thirds of a mile long uh, with a very nice hairpin at the far end. We've tried to keep the speed down by putting in some very good tight sections and uh, there's some very good bomb holes which will slow it down and good yumps for which most people will enjoy driving. The maximum speed I would think along the bottom on our club pre-run was approximately about between 75 and 80 miles an hour. It then obviously you know you, you've cut your average time down by the tighter sections uh, going through the ruts and uh, the tight and twisty parts. 
most of our club on previous event enjoyed it, so I hope everybody here will be able to do the same. Once the drivers are out there on the course, they're in their element. It's what they've waited all year for. For the spectators, and for us, the action is fast, furious, but above all, fun.
For Andrew Flanders, this year's National was a sad occasion. A change in the rules means his rear-engined Land Rover will be illegal by next year's championship. Still, doubtless he'll be back with a more conventional machine. Bob Ivins in 431 was in the privileged position of being sponsored by Land Rover owner. With LRO sponsoring the speed event, surely Bob was in with a chance. Well, with a little help from teammates, including John Hewitson in 231, his staffs and shops team indeed carried off the team trophy. Carmen, the fastest grander in the northwest, was another competitor making the intimate acquaintance of the local forestry. Clearly not a member of the Green Party. Could it be Larry Grayson in car 492? Everard, shut that door. Jean-Luc Guillaume had cleaned up his Range Rover after the tribulations of Saturday's team recovery. He was taking things very carefully. Perhaps he was thinking of the wide open spaces of the Paris-Dakar rally. Perhaps it was just the thought of driving back to France tomorrow. As the finish times of each competitor are relayed back to the control center, Dee's worst nightmares are coming true as the results come in thick and fast. Four, three, nine, eight, two, seven. Check. For this spectator, a tree seems to prove the safest viewing point.
No, no, I don't know. We had a bad arm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we had a good run there. Yeah, yeah. for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a French Ranger we came past him. Last one. Stop, stop, stop. Our club. Yeah, our club. Stop, stop. We're the serious club. <laughs> so let's take a look at the class winners in action once again. Kicking off with class one. Dave George is the name. Staffs and Shrops the club. Here he is, earlier in the day, putting his vehicle through its paces.
So, back in the pits and a victorious Drew Bowler, winner in Class 9 and overall winner of the comp. Here being congratulated by Glenn Thompson, who came second in the class and overall. Great. Happy with the... Uh, come a long way and took for the result. Yeah, great. It's in the class nine, it's a 88 inch series one profile special, so it's like a Range Rover chassis and this skeleton goes on top of that with a roll cage and safety bars in it and then it's all just panelled up as an early series one Land Rover. It's, it seems very well run, um, this, this comp safari seems very fast, there's one or two people thinking it's a little bit too fast, but uh, you know, it's, it's a sport that you've got to drive the event as it's laid out, that's, that's it. Drew taking first place, but followed closely by Glenn Thompson, the flying vicar, driving for the Pennine Club. How did Glenn find the course? The course, it's good. It's, it's coming up really bad in the, in the trees. Um, the straights are still okay. Um, the soft parts in the trees are cutting up quite bad, exposing a lot of ropes and, and rocks. You've got to be quite steady over those, otherwise you damage your vehicle. But uh, it's, I like the course, it's well, this vehicle is well suited to it. On the final run, the Flying Vicar looking all set to win. Blown it. Unfortunately, just about 300 yards after the start, I clipped a, a small rock that was hidden in the bracken and it flipped us onto a side. And I must have lost 20, 30 seconds. So there's no way I've beaten Andrew, but uh, good one after that one. hopefully I can keep the fastest time of day. I was trying my hardest to uh, make up time afterwards, but uh, that's how it goes. No, it's just one of them things. Um, I suppose we're lucky to finish an event like this with minimal damage, really. Um, you know, I mean, some of the motors that are coming around here are coming back absolutely wrecked. So, uh, I'm pleased to finish. Glenn Thompson there. Despite the roll in his final run, the Flying Vicar still managed second place, only 25 seconds behind Bowler. Gary Chick from Southern Land Rover Club finished third, 20 seconds behind Glenn. That's despite engine problems in the early runs. Perhaps the final words should come from those on both sides of the fence, organisers and competitors. Was it all worthwhile, lads? We've had a very enjoyable day. Um, things have gone really according to plan. We've uh, had 91 entries, only six competitors have dropped out. Um, which is very good. It's usually you get after the first two runs at least uh, 25 to 30 percent have crashed or gone out of the course. So today we've had an excellent day. Superb feeling of satisfaction to see people here happy and enjoying themselves over a weekend like this. It was good, it was odd, but we still hit the tree. <laughs> As you can tell, we are really serious yes, about this. Yes, we are the serious party. We enter this sport with a serious attitude. Yeah. There's lots of petrol, lots of bodywork, lots, lots of springs, of money. Lots, lots of money. Yeah. Lots of but we enjoy ourselves yeah. and we laugh. <laughs>